Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have the CEO, Sean Krakowski from Nanalysis. Nanalysis trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol NSCI, and it also trades on the OTC under NSCIF. The company is currently trading at 37 cents with about 111 million shares outstanding or about a $41 million market cap. Today is April 18th, the day of the recording, and I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Trevor. Um, Sean, um, I haven't seen you in a long time, so thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, My pleasure. I, under I understand you are uh, traveling. I know when when I knew you a little bit better, you were a traveling fiend. Uh, so <laughs> it seems that hasn't stopped. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to have you with us today. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with the story. Um, it'd be great to get a little bit of a summary. Um, and those that are familiar, we're going to get a good update here. So I'm going to hand it over to you. You've got a couple slides, but uh, important for, for especially the new people, remind us exactly what an analysis uh, does. Thanks very much, Paul. It's great to be back with you. And yeah, an analysis has disruptive magnetic resonance technology. Uh, we One day we hope to offer... Um, MRI machines for next generation healthcare that um, works the way we all want them to work rather than, you know, getting an argument with your doctor and begging them for an MRI for your foot and your doctor asks you silly questions like, you know, do you really need, need your foot to do your job and something? Well, no, but I'd like to, you know, maybe play tennis with my granddaughter kind of, you know, like that whole rigmarole, right? So we've got a vision uh, on how to change that and, and not alone with an ecosystem of, of partners and so on, but that's sort of what our company does. And then, you know, pretty, um, um, a business strategy around sort of pra practicalities of, 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 you know, going after unregulated market and get set, establishing a solid business before we really um, penetrate the regulated part of the healthcare market. Um, we do seek safe harbor for forward looking statements. Um, we, we, we think we're a unique um, stock on the TSX Venture Exchange in, in that we have like sexy technology and great products with a lot of blue sky opportunities, but we also have very sticky recurring um, service based revenue um, and, you know, real solid business. Um, you know, that's laying the foundation for a lot of the blue sky stuff that that we have. We're in a tremendous space, you know, the general space that we're in is scientific instrumentation. It's a huge and, and growing global market. You know, we, we feel like the uh, our the portion of this market that we can address is is approximately four billion today and growing. But it's a great space to be in. Um, some of the companies that are in the competitive landscape are companies like Thermo Fisher, um, which is a large NASDAQ listed company, which is sort of made well known because they are the number one maker of PCR tests that we all learned about during COVID and so on. Um, but there, there are several other players that sort of define what our, what our space is. Um, my vision is to sell direct in every major market in the world. And right now our priority is the United States. Uh, so we have a pretty good sales footprint print there, direct sales footprint, and also in certain parts of Europe. And then in international markets like Japan or, or India, we sell through a network of local dealers that sell complementary products and services. Um, we've shipped over a thousand of our portable MRI machines um, to industrial customers. And that's sort of the twist of, of our company is that um, MRI technology is also used by big pharma, food, petrochemicals, and, and so on. Um, and we're leveraging the similarities between the industrial need for MRI um, and, the, and the need in the, in the healthcare system. So not a pre-revenue company by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you already mentioned our, what our market cap uh, looks like. We did about 28 million in 2023, and we're experiencing um, significant growth right now. Just a fabulous management team, uh, including a CTO, has a real unique vision for the future of magnetic resonance. Um, and then a new addition to our executive team, which has taken over the services part of our business. And the catalyst for that was a large $160 million contract. Uh, that we want to service imaging equipment. Um, and and we, we put a person in charge of that business for us named Shime Burich. 
senior independent board of directors, um, where we've miniaturized and democratized magnetic resonance technology. And that's our, that's our, our core competence from a, from a technology perspective. But we are also built, um, building out a, a fully vertically integrated operate, operating company. And I'll, I'll show you evidence that we've succeeded uh, at doing that. Here's a look at our product portfolio. Our flagship products are the products on the top left. We build a common platform upon which we've launched several different types of products, both directly and through partners. We have a suite of accessories as well. Um, and then the bottom is meant to highlight um, the recent um, addition of this recurring services stream uh, for not only servicing our products, but servicing third-party equipment again. So in a way that's analogous to what I just said about my vision being to have direct sales in every major market in the world, we also want to have direct service capability um, in um, in every major market in the world so that we control our own destiny. Um, and we've really been really opportunistic in that regard. Um, our technology is fully patent protected um, and developed from scratch in house with the core team um, still all with us. Um, and we also have proprietary manufacturing and that's meant to protect in our intellectual property as well as have full control over our COGS and quality. So this slide is emblematic of what I mean by not just sort of miniaturization of the MRI technology, but more the, the general democratization of it. And, and our partners and, and customers are telling us that in the future, they want the data from MRI machines to look more like the data on the right. In other words, answers to questions rather than just raw data that you know somebody with a PhD in engineering needs to, to uh, interpret or a radiologist and so on. So we're doing a lot of this ourselves and some of it with partners. Um, really um, started the whole company from scratch. So, you know, did all the things that you'd expect from a quintessential technology startup. Got a lot of exciting catalysts coming down the pike. Um, and we, we just really think we have a bright future. Um, so I'm going to now give a little bit of a sort of, a, you know, almost it's almost a financial update is, is what it is. So anybody who's been following us for the last couple of years, this is meant to address some of the specific questions that they would have. If somebody hasn't been following us, that this might appear a little bit out of out of place. So I apologize to, to those people, but happy to elaborate if there's clarity required. Um, so um, about a year and a half ago or so, a little bit more than that, we won this large contract with the government of Canada, um, the Canadian version of the TSA, which is called CATSA to service imaging and, and scientific equipment in airports. Um, and it's got, um, First term is five years for 160 million, and then it's got two five year renewal terms that are indexed to inflation. So I think of it as a $480 million contract indexed to inflation. I mean, we're doing a great job for the customer. They've said so publicly, um, and they're paying our performance bonuses. And it's so sticky um, that, you know, uh, I have full confidence in saying that I believe it's a 15 year opportunity. And, and we're leveraging that the customers um, um, giving us references to other, other customer opportunities. And there's partners involved in this contract, which we've built great relationships with. So we'll expand this business into the United States um, and other parts of the developed world. Um, I won't get into too much of, of the details of exactly what we're doing unless somebody asked me, but I'll just say that the, uh, we publicly announced not that long ago that the project is um, EBITDA positive and, and that the profitability margins are expanding. Right now, the revenue is approximately $1.5 million per month. Uh, it took us a lot of time and money to get here, by the way. It wasn't easy, which is probably the main reason why our stock price uh, has sucked for the last year and a half. Um, but, you know, we think it's going to be a really solid revenue base for us um, um, indefinitely going, going forward. So this is meant to get, give guidance. Um, and, you know, I would never show a slide like this when I first met Paul and we were talking about, um, you know, trying to do $8 million a year in, in revenue or something like that. But I think now is the sort of right time. So this is meant to just sort of give people insight into kind of our budget, where some of the ratios are at. Um, and that again, we're we're a full-blown operating company. We're we're not a tech startup, so um, we we have all the the blue sky stuff left in, that a tech startup would have. But we also have a solid solid base. So you can see we're sort of evolving into a company where, 
you know, one at one point, a hundred percent of our budget was R and D, and now we're moving into you know R and D budgets that are sort of like you know orthodox percentages of revenue and, and stuff like that. So um, we we we've been stating publicly that um, we're going to generate positive EBITDA and that those EBITDA margins are going to. Sorry, is somebody asking a question? Okay. Um, Paul, can you just confirm that you can still hear me? I feel like something. I can hear you perfectly, you bet. Okay, thank you. So, um, so yeah, um, and then if you prefer the picture, you know, this is kind of how the next few years of our business is going to go. And again, please don't, um, please don't take this as sort of guidance from a CFO. But I have no problem with you know a year from now you asking me about, hey, Sean, you you said you were going to do forty million in twenty twenty four, and you know explain what you actually like that. I have no problem with. Just don't take it as sort of formal guidance. But I do want to paint the picture of the kind of company that I think we are today. Um, and I'll also um, kind of juxtapose what we've been and what we're going to be um, with a few bullet points on another slide here. Um, you know, we think we're, you know, we're, we're, gen we're, we're positioned to just start generating really amazing uh, operating cash flows as a business. So, you know, while our balance sheet hasn't been um, that great in the last couple of years, mostly because of this, um, what was an unplanned um, project win, a contract win that I just referred to, um, but but we feel that that's going to change um, sustainably going forward, and so so yeah, so for somebody like Paul or, or many others that kind of have watched what we've done since we've gone public in mid 2019, um, you know our plan at that time explicitly was okay, we're at about we're at about you know eight million in, in revenue kind of run rate or, or even trailing 12 months where well, we're going to quadruple it. and we did that um we we quadrupled the number of em employees so i'm not sure i know paul's run businesses and I'm sure many of you have and you know quadrupling the number of employees in in, in a company you know it, it has its own challenges uh on it on its own and we've successfully uh done that um profitability was never part of our objectives especially when this this big contract win um, was sort of interjected um, into the situation. So we've just been trying to manage for, for growth of different different um, varieties, like top line growth, headcount growth, um, and so on. Um, you know, R and D was was hundred percent of our of our budget at one point, and then was sort of fifty percent. And a lot of the product development and R and D um, initiatives we took on were highly risky, like deep tech stuff. Um, and then, um, you know, we did four acquisitions, including sort of a partial acquisition. We, we raised over 40 million and the amount of dilution, which I'm not proud of, I'm just staying as, you know, I'm, but I'm not ashamed of either. It's just a fact that um, a part of our plan was to raise a shitload of money and we were going to incur dilution. So, you know, some of the money we raised was over at a buck a share. So I actually am proud of that. And then some of the money that we raised was, you know, maybe not at a, at a great price. And yeah, that part I'm not proud of. So, but, you know, four years of, of you know, very aggressive uh, activity. Um, and then what about the next four years, right? Um, um, you know, so basically everything will be different. So we built a foundation, we built a base, we've proven, we, we publicly announced, for example, our Q4 revenue was just under 10 million. Um, and so if you but if you look at where we're going to be, we're not going to do any of those things. Right. So so I'm still going to try to like double or triple revenue, but with the current um, with the current base that we have. And yeah, um, once we sort of get through this this um, this next little bit, we will allow um, headcount growth to, to, to go up. But, but it's not going to quadruple or double or anything. It's going to over four years, it might ease up by 20 or, or 30 percent. Um, Profitability is an immediate focus, and I've been staying that now consistently for several months. You know, R and D is an orthodox percentage of our of our budget. Um, you know, we, we're we're an innovating we're an innovation company, but we're all also a real business with operational activity. So we'll always be an innovation company, but we will never go back to the other parts of, of our history where you know almost the entire company was all about R and D and risky uh, activity, and also a risk profile has changed in terms of the type of 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 things that are risky so we can we have a capability now because of the 
of the intellectual property that we have and the, um, the technology platform that we have that we can do really innovative stuff without it sort of constituting kind of existential risk um, for our company like like was a reality in the past. And so short answer is no more ex no more acquisitions, you know, now if we, our stock you know, when you get it over $3 a share and we have some specific opportunities, but, but in terms of just like doing acquisitions um, that was part of our plan, like before, no, that's basically all on hold. Um, and then same thing with equity financings and, and yeah, um, it, you know, at, you know, stock price and so on. And, and if it's minimal dilution, then, then, you know, there's some things that we might do, but, but not like in the past where it's just like, yeah, we're just going to raise as much money as we can. So in terms of our intentions, um, you know, everything is going to be different um, in the next four years relative to the, to the last four years. Now, some people won't like that. Some people want us to continue on with that trajectory, but, but those people also don't like our stock chart. So um, we're doing, we're going to do what we, um, what we need to do to, to make our, our stock chart look a lot better and get ourselves fair, fairly valued and sort of out of respect for shareholders who have invested a lot of their precious capital in the company, you know, do what we want them to do. Um, and it's, it's the right time for our company to do that anyway. So it's, it's not pandering, it's just, uh, you know, kind of uh, aligned interests and realities. So one of the things that I haven't really liked over the last couple of years is mostly because of the acquisitions and one in particular, our financial statements have just been ridiculous and impossible to understand, right? So um, that's going to change. You're, you're going to see a clearer, easier to understand financials, um, you know, over the coming quarters. Um, but this is this is basically um, what our sort of profitability tra trajectory looks like is, you know, we're, we are reducing costs without affecting revenue and our revenue is going up like contractually and, and in terms of sales funnels, it is going up. So, um, you know, where I've marked, um, like you'd see in a, on a map at a mall, that's kind of where we're at in terms of our financials. So when I look at our financials, basically I see this. Um, and, and yeah, all the stuff to try to figure out again because of the acquisitions has just been a mess, but that won't be the case going forward. So that's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions or, or to go back over any, any parts of, of this and, and, uh, and just have a great discussion. Perfect, thanks, uh, thanks Sean. Uh, yeah, reminder everybody, if you've got a question you'd like me to ask Sean, uh, use the chat function and uh, we'll ask the question. Um, the, uh, a couple things, um, Sean, um, M&A, uh, I think you said four acquisitions in, in the past here. Um, do you feel like you, you've got, like, what, what was the reason for the M&A and what, if anything, do you still want to accomplish with any kind of M&A? Right. So, um, so because we wanted to build out a, a fully vertically integrated um, um, instrumentation company, um, the acquisitions were all of all different types. So our first one was uh, a classic technology tuck-in. We were in the process of developing a new product, um, our, our 100 megahertz product, and we had a classic buy-build decision to make um, with regards to um, the electronics and the low-level software. Um, and we just we found out that there was a distressed company um, that we'd known about um, in Strasbourg in Europe, and we we could um, buy the whole company for the same prices as we would have licensed the technology. So we decided to do that to get full control of it, um, and it's and it and it's now um, a significant like I'll say one third of our 100 megahertz product, which you know has huge potential for. Us. So that was a technology tuck-in. Uh, another one was totally different. It was pure sales and service. Um, and, and, and it's a company called K prime that we acquired that, um, had spent 20 years selling scientific equipment on behalf of Agilent. And so all that Agilent equipment goes into labs and other places that is very complementary to where our products go. And so, um, we wanted to scale our sales organization and, and that was a, a great way to do that. We paid, you know, like one times trailing 12 months revenue to, to buy that company. Um, and although it wasn't planned. Um, it's indicative of how each acquisition has been totally different and strategic. That's the company that won the $160 million contract a few months after we acquired them. Um, we didn't believe that was a reality. We thought it was just their founder was trying to um, increase his valuation when he was negotiating with us six months before that. But lo and behold, 
um, we had a way to, you know, profitably scale up our, our services organization. So, so in other words, there was different reasons why, um, why we, we, we wanted to do those acquisitions um, because we're, we're, you know, we're building out this, this full-blown operating company with direct sales and service in every major market in the world and a few different types of magnetic resonance products. Mm -hmm. But in, in terms of the future, there's only one more um, need that we have in terms of acquisitions. And again, I want to emphasize, we've put that need on hold. So when I've shown you those, um, those, those revenue forecasts and so on, I'm not including what I'm about to say in any of that. <clears throat> but um, we have some partners that we work with on custom research MRI projects for human medical imaging. And there, yeah, there's a couple more small acquisitions that I'd like to do um, to launch a, an FDA approved application specific prevention centric um, MRI machine for, um, um, for human medical imaging. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, if certain things had been different, I probably would have done a couple of those acquisitions, at least one of them already. The relationships are still warm. You know, they're, they're run by brilliant scientists that, um, don't know how to, how to raise money and don't know how to scale a business, but have been selling key modules to Siemens and GE for 20 years. So I'm confident that they're still going to be around. So yeah, I'd like to do those. I've been staying that consistently publicly, but they're on hold because of the dilutive effect and also the operational challenges that we've just sort of overcome. But man, the last two years have been painful. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Like what, what do you find is your greatest challenge? What, what sort of keeps you up at night right now? So, yeah, so right now, um, we're trying to keep our growth trajectory going, which we're succeeding at, but we're trying to reduce costs to get to cash flow positivity. So not just EBITDA positive, not just net income positive, but, but you know, positive free cash flow to shareholders. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, that's different. Like I'm a, I'm a tech startup guy. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been doing doing tech startups and working with PhDs and trying to figure out if they're lying to me or not mm -hmm. for 27 years. So what we're doing now in terms of scaling uh, our operating business is a bit of a different challenge than than sort of what my sweet spot has been uh, um, over the last 27 years. So I'm taking it as a professional challenge. Um, but yeah, building a real business and 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 generating real profits is is difficult, um, and but we're we're totally united on that in terms of our board and key shareholders and, and management and employees. So mm -hmm. you know we've got a great team. I'm I'm an old hockey player, you know, uh, almost almost pl played for the LA Kings so long time ago. So I you know uh, I I'm comfortable in a team. I like it when when sort of my fate is in the hands of a teammate who mm -hmm. can score goals or back check or or maybe is a good goalie. So that's kind of how I'm I'm. I'm, I'm thinking about this right now. I'm part of a hockey team and, and we're trying to win the cup and we've lot of, got a lot of great, great players, but yeah, it's a grind. Like it's a grind mm -hmm. every night right now, every mm -hmm. night it's a grind. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, now you, you sell into a whole bunch of different industries, everything from food to pharmaceutical to even law enforcement and things like that. Is, is there one sector that seems to be catching uh, sort of more, call it more fire than others or you know, wh wh where are you seeing the real opportunities? Yeah, pharmaceutical is is the best one for us right now in terms of the different verticals. It doesn't constitute the majority of our revenue right now, but it is the mm -hmm. biggest one. And it's also the one with the biggest um, potential. So um, so right now, you know, um, most people think that if you buy a bottle of Advil one day and then two months later, you buy another bottle of Advil that, you know, that you're getting precisely the same um, medication. It, it's totally untrue. The, 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 that vertical is in, is in huge need of um, more regulation for consistency and also for health. Um, and, um, and, and there's a lot of regulatory tailwinds for us coming in terms of using benchtop magnetic resonance for QAQC, for control of manufacturing facilities. Um, and we're involved in a lot of a very exciting projects associated with big pharma along those lines. And magnetic resonance is by far the best technique for um, determining what molecules, including their um, nuances like their chirality, which is like the handedness of mm -hmm. molecules. So, so pharma is really um, where I see the most potential going forward. Mm -hmm. 
And and as far as innovation, I mean, you're constantly innovating. What where, what direction do you take your technology next? Right. So like a lot of successful hardware companies, um, you know, eventually it becomes about software applications, right? Like mm -hmm. like companies like Cisco and so on started out as pure hardware plays, but today Cisco has way more software people than than hardware people. So that's kind of where we're at right now is, is you know, uh, we've got a stable, high quality hardware platform. And, and now it's about a vertical market of software applications um, developed by ourselves, but also with partners. So a lot of innovation going on on the software side. And, and um, I noticed recently you did close a financing. Um, yeah. Just generally how, you know, we, we haven't seen very many financing. So to successfully close a financing, I think is a bit of a coup. Um, how, what, what was the environment uh, like for you to go out and raise money? I know. Uh, I appreciate you saying that, by the way, Paul. I know you've uh, you, you're very knowledgeable on the, on the market. So, um, but um, yeah. So basically, we just have really great existing shareholders, both both retail and institutional uh, shareholders, and 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 they came up very big for us. There's, they have big positions in our company. They really like our company, and they and they have full access to it too. By the way, we we bring them over, we show them around. So um, a lot of loyal shareholders, and then. Um, Echelon, who's our, our, you know, has kind of done these deals for the last couple of times. We've got really good trusting relationships with them. A great analyst coverage over there from from Stefan, mm -hmm. um, and um, so you know we worked hard together as as a team to 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 get it done with a mix of support from existing shareholders and, and new shareholders brought in from Echelon and, and a couple others that helped us out. So uh, you know a lot of people told us that we weren't going to be able to pull this off. Um, but because of our great team, we were able to pull it off. And I know a lot of people's financings haven't succeeded in the recent environment. So, um, yeah, we feel really good about that. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, so as, as investors, as we're watching you guys right now, what, what do you think are the key metrics or maybe catalysts that we should pay attention to, to, to make sure that you guys are sort of heading in the right direction? Right. So, um, You know, in terms of like what I believe is is going to get our stock price to recover is when the market starts to believe that this is true. So, so when you're watching our quarterly results, and you know, in the past people would look at our top line, and and our top line stuff is going to be great. There's there, you know, without question. Um, but people want to see that are we're moving towards EBITDA positive, and and then also cash flow positive. So I believe that the market is going to um, want to see evidence that, uh, like, I'm not deluding myself that um, this is in 2001 and, and, and this is a show me market. So, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, um, this is what this is what it's going to, I think, going to make our stock price recover and, and start maybe start to generate a, a little bit of, of excitement. So if I was a third party uh, investor, uh, just sort of looking at watching us, I, I would be looking for evidence that this slide is true. Mm -hmm. Very fair, fair, fair. Um, all right. So the last question is is really open ended. Um, key takeaway: What what do you want to make sure uh, everybody walks away with uh, understanding about the business today? So the main thing is that at our core, we're um, a deep tech innovation company that is solving a real problem, which is taking the most important. Um, analytical and imaging technique, which is magnetic resonance, that's a fact, and we've miniaturized it successfully, and we are democratizing it. So, I mean, that's who we are. That's what our DNA is. Um, and as a third-time entrepreneur, um, this time around, I wanted to control my own destiny in terms of being able to to grow and scale the business. So we added on some of these other dimensions, right? Like I've talked about, like, like service contracts and, and, and large, larger direct sales or organizations. So if you want to support a really innovative deep technology company that's sold these portable MRI machines in over 150 countries around the world and is committed to profitable, profitability and growing a world-class business, then buy our stock. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, this is great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we've been speaking with Sean Krakowski, uh, an analysis scientific, uh, symbol NSCI on the Venture Exchange, NSCIF on the OTC. 
Sean, uh, safe travels, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate it. Take care. Take care.